Good afternoon to you. I am Mark Sutter of HurricaneTrack.com here. It is Monday, April 10th, 2023, and it's time for our weekly discussion here. We're going to start off with a look at what is going on in the tropics globally. First of all, that's not my normal background. I'm on vacation with the family, enjoying some spring break time with them before things get really busy in the world of work for my life. As you guys know, if you have a big family like I do, you stay pretty much busy all the time. But work's going to get busy for me certainly at the end of April through probably the next several months with severe weather and of course the upcoming hurricane season, the desert monsoon season, and probably a lot of other things going on in between all of that. So let's talk about what's happening out there. We do have some stuff related to the tropics that I want to show you way over in a different part of the world than we are used to seeing. This is in the Western Pacific and this is in the Southern Indian Ocean. And it's this feature right here that we need to be most concerned about in the short term and uh, this is an invest area. It's 18 Southern Hemisphere. So the Southern Hemisphere has invest just like we do when we name the systems with these numbers, right? In the Northern Hemisphere, like 91L or 93E for Eastern Pacific, the same thing is uh, happening with the way these invests get labeled or numbered in the Southern Hemisphere in the Western part of the Pacific or what have you. So let's take a look at what we have here with this system. We're gonna click on it real quick. This will take us over to what's going on with it. It's off the coast. A uh, pretty good clip there from Australia, but it could be moving in their direction. So there's a lot of information here. But I want to just show you a couple of tweets here, at least this tweet from Mike Adcock, who's tracking this system. This is what it looks like on satellite, starting to develop some deeper convection. Remember, in the southern hemisphere, these are going to rotate clockwise, the circulation with these features. And it looks like it's going to be headed towards our friends down here in Australia. All right, so a little bit confusing as to what we're looking at. We're not used to seeing this. Let me back it up first of all as well. Uh, this is where we are currently and there is the feature right there. All right, so it'll be moving to the south and eventually making landfall it looks like somewhere along the northwest coast of Australia in Western Australia and it could be pretty intense. The different models that forecast these types of things. This is the GFS depiction and it really ramps it up there. That's the 850 millibar level of the atmosphere. Let's switch it over to the surface real quick. Mean sea level pressure. Where does it drop it? 921 millibars. Now, hopefully, this is the GFS just kind of going nuts with this system. Maybe some convective feedback and other things that are happening with the mechanics of the model. And I've seen a few people tweeting about this over the last couple of days as the various guidance has latched onto this system really deepening it as it heads towards the coast of Australia. Nevertheless, it looks like the environment could be very favorable for this to strengthen, and it could be a major headline-making event for our friends in Western Australia, just to get you, get you caught up on a little bit of your geography here. And not going to lie, I had to myself. you got Western Australia over here. Our system is trying to develop in this area right here, and it's going to move towards the south eventually, maybe the Port Headland area along this northwestern coastal region of Australia. Don't know exactly where, obviously. Uh, luckily, it is kind of sparsely populated, but sparsely populated isn't the same as no one lives there. So anybody along this area of the northwest coast of Australia are going to want to watch this closely. Again, I think this will be a big newsmaking event, and through the magic of social media, at least what magic is left of it, we'll be able to track this pretty solidly. Now let me go back to the Tropical Cyclones Guidance uh, Project here, the uh, RAL page as I call it. This is another area of interest, Invest Area 90W, you know, for Western Pacific, Invest 90W or W90, whatever you want to call it. This one is less of a threat for becoming a major intense system. Where is it, you may ask? This is the disturbance right here. Uh, got some sort of the cyclonic flow a gyre, if you will. We see that often with these systems, a large envelope of energy. And uh, it's sitting over here just to the east of the Philippines in the Philippine Sea, a very favorable area, generally speaking. Warm water temperatures, very deep warm water. This tries to consolidate as it moves inland over north uh, portions of the Philippines as a big rainmaker. And I know a lot of people say, yawn, rain, whatever. Hey, rain is an impact. Rain causes flooding. Flooding causes destruction and potentially the loss of life. So, again, just something to watch as the 
area of that part of the world, the southern hemisphere, and certainly here north of the equator near the Philippines, starting to fall under the influence of this building Madden Julian oscillation or an overall enhancement of those westerly winds, more convergence where the air is coming together, and it's trying to sort of work its way into this gradual shifting of the ENSO, E-N-S-O, the El Nino Southern Oscillation Phenomenon, to one that is more positive, or El Nino. We're heading in that direction almost inevitably, and I think it's just going to be a matter of how strong this El Nino is going to be. So we'll watch this. And then there's another system that might try to sneak up there as well in the Western Pacific, as again, that area out there becomes more favorable over time. So real quick, looking at what we watch regarding the ENSO, our numbers, our index numbers here, last 30 days, we're at negative 1.45. Typically speaking, the Australian Bureau of Meteorology here, the BOM, they look at about a minus 7 and lower as being more of a, an El Nino, sorry, an El Nino number. So once we see minus 7, especially in that 90-day number, now, the 90-day number is still positive at plus 5, so we have to lose about 12 points. Basic math. Easy, right? Wait till you try thermodynamics one day. That's why I didn't do it. Stuck with geography and statistics. Uh, but that being said, yes, we have about 12 points to give up before we get to that minus 7 in the longer term. That's that 90-day time frame that is a better perspective as to what's happening. But let me take me away. We can see what's going on with the charting here, the graph, we've seen in recent weeks that we have definitely come down, gradually lost uh, ground, if you will, on both the 90-day and the 30-day, and that has led us closer to this El Nino that we've been, we've been hearing a lot about. And we can see this start to really show up here, especially in the eastern Pacific, a lot of very warm water relative to average here. Some of these anomalies right off the coast of South America there um, I mean, almost off the scale, four to five degrees Celsius above average, and still starting to warm up just a little bit in the equatorial regions of the true Nino 3.4 area. Uh, basically, all of the Enso regions, the El Nino Southern Oscillation regions, in, encompassing pretty much this part of the Pacific Ocean, and you do include a part just south of the equator there in the Nino 1-2 area, as you can see, what I've drawn there, it's all starting to fill in with more warmth. However, and I'm just curious about this, okay? We do, we do still have this very cold PDO look, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, and we have the very warm Atlantic look overall, the positive AMO. So a negative PDO over here, a positive AMO look in the Atlantic, and then of course the very warm Gulf of Mexico. However, the Gulf really separate from the influences of El Nino. The Gulf is its own area and it's always warm enough typically for strong hurricanes, not as influenced by shear that comes from a warming Pacific. All right, But it's just interesting. We, I saw Dr. Phil Klotzbach at the National Hurricane Conference last week. He talked about this both in his presentation and privately at our lunch table that this is a really interesting look overall and if it weren't for what's going to probably happen out here, we could be looking at a very, very active hurricane season. So it's going to be really hard to figure this one out. What's going to happen this hurricane season in terms of the overall numbers? There is a big fascination with that from a lot of people. Some people don't care. They just, you know, watch and see what happens, and that's fine too. As far as what the numbers are, you know, it, it, I don't know. I don't know how to judge this one. This is really interesting because both the Atlantic and the Pacific could be very, very warm relative to average at the same time. And there are really no analogs. In other words, you can't go back and say, well, when did this happen before? I don't think it ever has to this extent if it holds. Now, we're getting closer now. We're within, well within 60 days of the start of the Atlantic hurricane season. You know, So will this hold on until July, August, September? The overall warmth in the Atlantic, a lot of the climate models say yes. While they also strengthen this area, strengthening the El Nino is what I mean by that, substantially. And that's going to have a lot of other implications beyond hurricane season that we will talk about at a different point in time. I'm probably going to have a couple of guests come on and address this as well. All right, so we're going to have to be watching this 
very closely in the coming months. All right, real quick at the uh, at quick look. I got to put a word in there. Quick, a quick look that is at the overall weather pattern. Look at these northeast winds here. Help if I draw on it where you can see it. And you say, well, how do you know those are northeasterly winds? Well, just look at the clouds. Onshore flow to the east coast of Florida. We're going to have some flooding concerns for the areas that Hurricane Nicole battered. Uh, so that's a problem. Um, and then kind of chilly in the east again, uh, yet the warmth is coming, I, I assure you. A couple things to note. There's the snowpack in the Sierra. Look at out here the Great Basin, the Wasatch, the Rockies. That's good. You want to see that, but the spring snowmelt will bring some flooding, and that's also going to happen up here with this snowmelt going on. We're going to have some rapid snowmelt in the nation's um, northern tier states, and that's going to lead to some problems as well. We can see that reflected in the National Weather Service map here, the watches and warnings. Uh, any of these greens up here, that is your hydrologic outlook or flood advisories, anything green is basically flood related. And now we're starting to see that really fill in out here because of snowmelt. I think that could be a very fascinating uh, part of the of extreme weather or whatever you want to call it, impactful weather. I like that term better, extreme weather. Everything doesn't have to be extreme. I know I just said it, but impactful weather, where it's impactful to us, the environment. That's something that I could be uh, possibly going out and, and covering in person, the spring snowmelt. We'll see. Uh, we also have severe weather season coming in uh, again. We've had a little lull lately, thank goodness. But that looks like it's going to ramp up, and I'll show you why I think that in just a moment. Meanwhile, back in the Carolinas, Virginia, and vicinity, yeah, some frost advisories again just can't seem to shake the uh, remnants of winter there, unfortunately. Uh, but it'll eventually shake itself out, and we'll be good to go. Real quick, water temperatures on the actual side of things. Warming up pretty good here off the mid-Atlantic and southeast coast overall. Well, the mid-Atlantic's more up here, I guess. But yes, water temperatures are warming. As we get close to the traditional start of summer, roughly around Memorial Day and that time frame, our water temperatures will be close to 80 in a lot of these areas, especially south of Cape Hatteras here. And you folks up here, you know, Jersey and points north, it takes longer. Delaware, Maryland, it takes a little longer. But it, we're getting there. We are. We're getting there. Now, where it is very warm already is the Gulf of Mexico, already 80 degrees or higher, or 26 Celsius, anywhere basically inside of this line that I have drawn. That's 27 Celsius or 81. I mean, good grief, already 81 right up against the coast there. Um, in fact, my daughter yesterday wanted to know if we could go back to Naples this summer. She really likes the waters right off of Naples there. She's like, hey, we'll see what we can do. They're very warm and they have a lot of interesting aquatic life down there. But water temperatures well on their way up. And of course the Gulf is running above normal. Again, it doesn't really impact hurricane season in terms of numbers, but you could get some more intense hurricanes. A few interesting things happen when the Gulf is warmer than average. And it especially seems to affect severe weather because there's just a lot more moisture and energy available. And with that, we'll go over to the SPC. This is today. I should have clicked on these earlier with my um, slower than desired internet here. That's fine. If they don't go to full screen, hey, maybe we'll eke it out. I'll bring me on to try to ad lib and kill some time. Today we do have a slight risk in parts of, I did look at it at least. It's trying. Uh, slight risk in parts of Oklahoma, Kansas. Um, and it's interesting because these types of setups, if I could just teleport my way out there, my family wouldn't like that because I'm on vacation. Uh, but you can get one or two tornadoes, some beautiful supercells, a couple of hail events. And again, as long as they don't hurt anybody, they are really fascinating to see these uh, tornadic events and, and hail cores, whatever. I think they're a pretty amazing phenomenon. Um, it's not going to be worth it for me to wait to try to load all these. But just keep in mind, that's your slight risk for today. You know, enough of a risk to take notice of it. Any storm chasers out there, be careful. Be careful with each other, too. Seriously, been quite a few close calls lately. Tomorrow, limited severe weather overall, so that's good. We're in this lull, like I said. And then finally, by Wednesday, day three of the outlook, as I try to ad-lib my way through it, I'll just jump in. It takes a little time for the internet here. Um, even less of an overall threat of severe weather. And then I'll just tell you, days four through eight so far, in the long range, nothing to really worry about. However, 
let's jump over to this tweet here from John. And John is kind of getting me interested a little bit because again, we do study severe weather. We go out and we track it. We test a lot of the equipment that we use during hurricane season and it helps us to get ready. Plus I think it's phenomenal in, in and of itself. Um, so yeah, the Madden Julian oscillation and what's happening with the atmospheric angular momentum, all of these different fancy terms basically boil it down after uh, we get towards the end of the month there, the 25th or so, getting into May, we should see a return to a more active pattern with western troughs coming in and that helps to open the door to the, to the potential of more severe weather. And one of the things that we want to do during some of this severe weather is to test a couple of our weather stations. I think it is safe to say that my project has all but mastered, you never completely finish anything, uh, that's why they call it practicing medicine or whatever, seriously. Um, we've done really well and come as close as we can as sort of conquering the realm of live cameras. We've captured some amazing things over the years, very helpful and uh, to, for a lot of reasons, from the social science to actually understanding storm surge in a pure scientific perspective. Now, I really want to work on wind data. And we've also done very well with pressure data, I might add. Those are easy. Wind data is a lot harder than you would think. And I don't want to get into it too much here because i got to finish. But we do want to take a couple of our weather stations that we have developed, um, RM Young systems, out into Tornado Alley, set them up, mainly for these big dry line events where you get a lot of wind coming out, and just put them through some paces in the real world. We could do wind tunnel testing spend some money to go to Clemson or down to FIU or something. I think that's where they have one. But that costs money. I'd rather spend that money out in Tornado Alley in a real world environment. So that's one of the things we're going to be doing. We're not going out there just for the heck of it. Yes, it can be beautiful and awe-inspiring. And of course, it can be dangerous for the people out there. But it's a laboratory that nature provides. And we can test some things and be ready for hurricane season because that's coming. El Nino or not, hurricane season is coming and nobody knows what is going to happen for sure between June 1st and November 30th, and I'm sure that you fine folks want us to be as ready as possible, right? All right. Thanks for tuning in. I do appreciate it. I am Mark Suddeth. Our channel, of course, is Hurricane Track over on YouTube. Don't forget, go ahead and subscribe, hit the notification button, like and share, and get all the algorithms excited about what we're doing, if, if, as excited as you are. I'd appreciate that. And it'll help you too. Have a good rest of your week. Again, I said it once, I'll say it again. I'm Mark Suddeth. I will talk to you again a week from today.